Hello and welcome. I am Scarperlock and this is Power Wash Simulator. Uh, we are still working on the lost building of Atlantis. Uh, this is the palace of Atlantis, I guess. And uh, there's we've done the outside and the top and now we're working on the inner upper floor here. Um, it's sort of arbitrary which one I'm doing. I'm just I started working uh, on this side and I just got a bunch of it clean. So we're going to continue here. And uh, as always, we're doing a Let's Rant uh, as we do this. And so, um, uh, let me just check the sound on this. I think that's probably okay. So as we go, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have another rant. And so this actually comes from two sources. It is something we have talked about before. But um, I've got a, a couple of little new angles to it, so I'm going to revisit it. So... We're going to be talking to a degree about rules and the rule of cool, but also about rulings. Um, and so there are two sources to this. Alex Macris, whose um, Arbiter of Worlds channel has, you know, he's been posting some videos to it, posted a video about rules versus rulings. Um, and uh, so you can go to his channel and watch that. And then during his most recent live stream, which was, I think, just yesterday as I'm recording this today is uh, May 7th I believe he recorded it on May 5th or 6th um, Luke Hart had a video uh, where he he was um, asked about rules and how much should you follow the rule how much does he follow the rules versus um, not and he brought up the rule of cool and mentioned it and so um, so I kind of want to cover both of those things and talk about it in a little bit more detail. So let's start with Alex Macris. Um, and in his uh, video, and one of the things you have to know, I don't know if he mentions has mentioned this on his channel, but one, I think he has. But one of the things you have to know about Alex Macris is he, uh, I don't know if he's a practicing lawyer, but he went to law school. And so he thinks about rules and rulings uh, in the context of the legal system quite often and um, he draws a lot of analogies to the legal system I think that are apt and that are actually quite uh, helpful to think about and so um, so he talks about the sort of the two types of ways to create a body of law common law and sort of legislation Right, and so with common law, why is this wall not cleaning? There we go. With common law, uh, what you have are, uh, you don't have a body of a written, uh, sort of predetermined laws legislation-wise, right, like from a legislature. Instead, what you have is a body of judicial rulings from judges. And these set precedent, and the rulings become the law, right? So when you don't have a written law, what you have is some sort of a means of determining what is okay and what's not by some kind of a judicial process, like a court trial or whatever. And then whatever is held in one trial is held to be true in the future, right? This legal precedent. And then, of course, the other way to do it is to have a written code of laws, and everybody follows the written law. And to some degree, modern, most modern, many modern sort of democracies like the United States and so on have, have kind of both, right? They have, we have written laws, and then we also have judicial precedent. And... Um, and so what he says is, if you have, say, a rules-heavy system, like Pathfinder 2E or Champions, where everything is spelled out for you, how you do everything is already encoded into the rules, and there's not a lot of sort of space for um, invention, at least in terms of game mechanics, right? Um, the, uh, that's the equivalent of having a very comprehensive body of written legislation those are the laws and um, the judge just interprets those laws right 
And um, alternatively, if you have a rules light system, then, which I guess may be something like Iron Sworn or Knave, if you have a rules light system, you have a system where most of the possible things that could happen aren't written in the rules. And the rules give you some guidelines, right? But most of what ends up happening is decided by the Game Master. The Game Master's rulings then become precedent. Right? So, um, one of his examples is you're playing, say, first edition D&D, and your characters come to a, a, a giant uh, ravine, a, 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 a large canyon or some some large space that, that that's very high up and they have to sort of get across. And the fighter says, can I jump across? I want to jump across. And so the game master looks up in the rules and sees that there are no rules under the fighter's class abilities one way or the other about how to jump a, a chasm. And so the Game Master decides, okay, well, this is a feat of dexterity. And if you, you, you know, you have a certain dexterity, right, 3 to 18, if you roll below your dexterity, you make it on a d20. So the fighter picks out his d20 and say he's got, I don't remember what numbers macros use, but let's say he's got a 12 dex, and he picks up the die and he rolls and he gets a, he gets a 10. The Game Master says, okay, you made it across the chasm safely. That is a ruling, right? And this now sets a precedent. There's no rule for how to jump chasms. But this sets essentially a, a legal precedent of ruling in this particular campaign, in this Game Master's game, that when you want to jump chasms, you use dexterity and you roll. you have to roll under your dexterity. Right, And so he said, what you have is, if you have a rules-heavy system, it'll tell you what you have to roll to jump a chasm, and you just do that. But if you have a rules-light system, what it kind of means is that the rules haven't been written yet, right? And the GM will be writing them as you go, and once those rules are written, you follow them the same way as the rule book. Right? It's like when you have a body of pre legal precedent rulings from judges, it's not any slimmer than the legal code of a legislative body. Right? It's just that the rulings were made kind of made up as you went instead of having been decided beforehand. Right? And it's the same thing with a rules light system. He said, if you're being a good game master and you're being consistent with your rules, you're going to slowly develop pages and pages and pages of past rulings on how you do that. Now, maybe you keep it all in your head, but you probably shouldn't, probably can't, right? And so you're going to have pages and pages of what we call house rules that are your rulings on matters that the book is silent about. Right? So the more things that the book is silent about, the more rules are going to be ones that you came up with as you went. But there's still rules of how you guys play the game. Right? They still determine how the game is played and what you're allowed and not allowed to do and how you make rolls and stuff like that. So, but the one thing he said is the, the danger of having... Um, of not having rules written down ahead of time, right, is that you have to be consistent, and there's always a risk if they're not written down, especially if you make a ruling and you don't write the ruling down, maybe after the session or something, that you're going to be inconsistent and rule different ways. So he said, again, going back to his example, let's say that the the magic user now, again, remember this is AD&D, looks down at his dex, and he sees that his dex is a 14. It's actually better than the fighter's. And he figures, well, it, uh, that, you know, if, if you have to just roll under, if I just have to roll under a 14 on d20 to make it, 
those pretty good odds, right, 70% chance, I'm going to jump across the chasm too. So he says to the GM, all right, I'm going to jump too. And the GM says, well, there are no rules under magic users for jumping chasms, so I'm going to rule that in your case, <clears throat> it's a feat of strength. Now here we have a problem, right, because the ruling is inconsistent. Why would it be a feat of dexterity for the fighter, but a feat of strength for the wizard? To make matters worse, the wizard's strength is only an 8. So now, when he thought he had, like, a 70% chance to jump the cliff, he actually only has a 40% chance. And if he'd known that, he wouldn't have tried to jump the cliff. Right? So now, by being inconsistent, the Game Master has maybe even caused this player's character to die when he fails his strength roll. And the player's going to be justifiably put out. Not because his character died. Yeah, okay, nobody wants their character to die, but because, well, if I'd known you were going to rule that mine was a feat of strength instead of a feat of dexterity, I wouldn't have done that. So why did the Game Master rule that way? That's arbitrary, right? And so his point is that one way or another, the rules need to be consistent, right? How you do something in one battle, when you do the exact same thing in the next battle, it should work the same way. So let's give an example. When I was uh, running D&D 5th Edition, my players came across a former battlefield from many years ago. And I actually, because I'm a, a psycho and I, I try to make everything realistic, I'm very concerned with verisimilitude, as you guys know, um, because I... I care about it that much I went to the extreme this is why I said I'm a psycho I went to the extreme of looking up how long it takes a body that's not buried because these guys were laying on the ground to decompose completely into a skeleton right to so make sure that when the party encountered these guys I was describing them with the right level of shall we say decomposition and however many years it had been since this battle, it was long enough that if they were left out exposed to the elements, their bodies would be completely skeletal. There wouldn't be any more meat left on them. So they came across a bunch of bones and skulls and partial skeletons and whole skeletons of Roman soldiers that had been killed by the slot eye. And they were... It was sort of like the scene in Alien... Um, where they come across a giant skeleton sitting in a chair and they can see that something burst out of its chest. Well, that's what they saw. Something had burst out of some of their chests because that's what slot I do, right? They're, they're basically a copy off the xenomorph, right? And so, um, at least the way some of them work. And so they saw this is toward the end of a session and um, obviously they were curious about it and they wanted to know more. And then uh, the session ended Right? And so the player of the cleric thought about this. And he messaged me. I don't know if it was on Discord or maybe he emailed me. He must have emailed me. I don't think we were using Discord yet very much. He emailed me and he said, hey, I have a, a question and I want like a DM ruling. Um, he said, uh, I have the speak with dead spell. Can I use it on a skeleton and he said the reason he asked was the spell specifies that the dead body must have a mouth and he said I'm not sure you know if a skull qualifies as having a mouth so I said okay let me think about this and again I'm all about the verisimilitude and the and realism and so on I'm also a biologist so I looked up I was pretty sure the answer should be no but I checked my anatomy sources, the anatomy textbook of work, and so on. The anatomical definition of a mouth includes the soft tissue, right? The tongue and the, the gums and, you know, the lips and so on and so forth. And a skeleton doesn't have those things. So by the biological definition, a skull does not have a mouth. Okay. Beyond that, um, the lower jaw right the mandible is not attached to the the rest of the skull by any bone it's attached by soft tissue which had decomposed in these former roman soldiers 
So there weren't, there really couldn't be a mouth. All right, so I explained this to him and said my ruling is that for the purposes of this spell you need soft tissue enough that the bottom of the jaw and the top of the jaw are still attached. Okay, and that qualifies it as being a mouth. And he said that's fine. You know, he didn't he didn't mind it. He said that makes sense to me. That's why he asked, right? So I've now made a ruling on how this spell works, right? It would be inconsistent for me, having made that ruling, to then say, um, the next time they come across skeletons, oh, you can you can use speak with dead on these skeletons, right? Because I've already ruled on how what we are, what we're calling a mouth for the for game purposes, and then it needs to stay that way. It's not you shouldn't be changing it, right? Because then the players never know what the rules are, and they're never sure what they're really allowed to do, and it also makes the world very sort of cartoonish and inconsistent. It destroys verisimilitude. Right, and so um, this is what Macris was saying as well. That once you make a ruling, you know, if you made a mistake, that's different. We're not talking about like, for example, my my guys were playing. Uh, we were playing Deadlands, and um, the party was riding into battle. They had they were on horseback, and they were riding into battle. And um, in Savage Worlds, if you're on a moving if anything, anything moving, it's called an unstable platform, and you have a minus two to your two hit rolls. Okay. So, um, the very first person to move was my best friend's character, who was far enough away that he had his horse do their move and then do a run roll. And I said, okay, this is an unstable platform, you have minus two. So a couple of them did that. And then because I made a mistake, I thought it was only unstable platform if they did the running. So I told them if they just did a regular move, it's not an unstable platform. So I'm going to have to correct this. okay? And point out to them that no, actually, it's an unstable platform if you're on a moving horse. Or just on a horse. If you're on horseback, it says it's an unstable platform. It says that in the rule book. Right? And so it's okay to change the ruling like that because you made a mistake, right? You say, guys, I misinterpreted this rule. I didn't look it up while we were playing. I thought I knew it, so I didn't look it up. And I made a mistake, and from now on, we need to play it correctly, so when you're on a horse, it's an unstable platform, right? That's okay. But if you're gonna say, some sessions it's an unstable platform, and some sessions it's not just based on, like, whim, right, then that, destroys the realism of the world and it also makes it really hard for the players to know what to expect like bandits are coming at them riding horses and they say okay we're going to get down from our horses and stand on the ground so that they have the minus two to unstable platform and we don't and i go oh well this time the bandits it's cool for the bandits not to you know to be riding at you so they're not going to have the unstable platform that's really not fair right it's very much not fair and so Macris's point is, one way or another, you end up with a body of rules. You might end up with it because you uh, bought a game like Pathfinder 2 that's very rules heavy. Or you might end up with it with a rules light game where you've made a bunch of rules for yourself and your group as you guys go, right? Because... Um, you needed to make rulings, and then once you make the rulings, then you guys play it that way the same the same way all the time, right? Oops, keep falling down. Um, let's just stay down here. Doesn't really matter. We'll just stay down here, work down here, so I don't keep falling. Um, I'll go back up and do the ceiling, probably off screen. And so he argues that one way or another, you need a consistent set of rules, whether it's rulings that once you make them have the force and effect of a rule, because that's how rulings work in a game like D&D or Champions, or actual explicit rules that the game has that you're following. But one way or another, you got to know how stuff works in a world. 
and it needs to work the same way every time, or you have what I've said many times is a cartoon world, right? You've got Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner. And, you know, those are fun to watch, but most people don't necessarily want to play cartoons. Unless you're playing the game, too. So now let's go to Luke's comment, because I think it's very much related. He was talking about the rule of cool. So what happened is he was asked, as a GM, how much do you, do you recommend, like, using the rules versus, you know, letting players do whatever is, is fun, you know? How much do you follow the rules? And he said, I follow the rules. Uh, he said it doesn't mean that sometimes they don't make some changes and stuff, but he said in general, he said, I follow the rules. He said, because to me, that's what makes it a game. Games have rules, and I follow the rules. And then he said something very profound, and this is why I don't like the rule of cool. He said, what about the rule of cool? Well, he said, I don't use it because... The rule of cool is like saying we're not going to have rules. It's not a rule. It's saying we're going to ignore the rules. And he said, I just don't think it's fun to play a game. Now, of course, everybody's different. But he said, I think it's just, it's, it doesn't uh, work for him and his group, for sure, to play a game with no rules. He said, that's where the challenge comes in. That's where the, that's where the, the game part comes in. If you don't have rules, you really don't have a game. You just have story time. And story time may be fun, but if you came to play a game, then you probably want to play the game and not have story time, right? You want to have rules. And this kind of dovetails with what I have always said about the rule of cool. And the reason I don't like it, and this connects with what Macris said, is because it's automatically arbitrary and potentially whimsical. Right? You're allowing it because it's cool. Well, what if it wasn't cool yesterday? Right? It wasn't described in a cool way. Right? The one player is really good at making up cool descriptions, so you let him get away with stuff. And the other player isn't that good at coming up with cool descriptions, so you don't let her get away with stuff. And that is arbitrary. And that's something that Macris talks about. The GM shouldn't be arbitrary. You should be consistent so that your world has predictable, knowable rules, um, predictable, knowable consequences for things, right? So that when players do something, they have some idea of the probable consequences. This isn't to say that there are no surprises. Of course there are, right? But if you fight zombies and after you kill them, they don't get back up. And then you fight the same zombies, and after you kill them, they get back up unless you cut their heads off. And then you fight the same zombies, and after you kill them, they get back up unless you cut their feet off. And then you fight the same zombies, and after you kill them, they get back up, no matter what you cut off. Um, those That makes things very inconsistent, and it's hard for players and their characters to succeed in an inconsistent world because they never know from one game session to the next, from one round of combat to the next, how the game master is going to rule about a particular thing, right? And um, this kind of brings back in the, I think I made a comment in one of my videos about, um, What is, let's see, Atrium Wall? Oh, this is all part of the same thing, I guess. I made a comment in one of my uh, videos about um, uh, Sly Flourish's Lazy Dungeon Master, and in it he talks, I think it's Lazy Dungeon Master, it might be the Lazy Dungeon Master Returns or something, uh, but he talks about basically the rule of cool, and that, like, players like to be awesome and they should be awesome and maybe he's the one who said you should be fans of your players and their characters and as a result he he you know he had an example where it's like oh well if they find a, a cool way to one shot the dragon let them right that's rule of cool and what i argued is i don't like that because 
you're only allowing it because it's cool, but the next time they fight a dragon, you, you, you know, like, are we going to one-shot every dragon? And if so, how easy is this game going to be, right? Is that what we want is just super easy? If you want it easy, you can do that. You don't need dragons for that, right? You can just fight kobolds. But it wouldn't be cool to one-shot a kobold. Okay, so now why is it cool to one-shot a dragon if it's only got D4 hit points, right? And a, and a five armor class. So... In that video, what I said was, the problem is, again, the lack of consistency, right? The fact that if you can one-shot a dragon, why not use the same technique to one-shot the trolls? Why not use the same technique to one-shot the bugbears? Why not use the same technique to one-shot the um, orcs, right? And now you're one-shotting everything. And so I think that you have to be very careful with the rule of cool. Because once you allow something because it's cool, if you don't keep allowing it, now it's arbitrary and whimsical. And as a GM, you shouldn't be arbitrary. Right? You should have consistent rules and consistent rulings. That's what Macris is talking about. And so... Um, so this is what Luke was saying with the rule of cool, right? It's, it's like having no rules at all, right? You're just allowing it because it's cool. And he said that there's no challenge to that. And also, it, you know, it's very inconsistent, right? He said the same thing. And so um, because both of these guys made unrelated videos that I think are connected, that just made me want to talk about this issue again, right? And again, point out, that what you want to have in a role-playing game is consistency, right? It's perfectly okay to homebrew and house rule things, right? But you want to do it in a consistent way. For example, I've talked about how with Counterspell, right, there's nothing in the rules that allows you to identify a spell as, as you're trying to counter it, so you have to counter blind. You're just, he's casting a spell, you don't know what it is, you just counter it, right? You hope it works. Um... My best friend didn't want it to work that way. He was upset about it. He said, what's the point of countering a spell if you don't know what it is? What's the point of identifying a spell if you can't counter it? And so somebody on the D&D Beyond forum had suggested that, like, his rule is if you can identify a spell as part of the reaction of identifying spells, which you could do in Xanathar's Guide, as part of the reaction, you're allowed to counterspell it. I said, okay, I'm go I, you know, we talked about it, my friend and I talked about it, and he liked that idea. And so I said, okay, I made a ruling, and I posted it to our, um, our uh, World Anvil site. Right? I have a, a several house rules on there. When I made the ruling about speak with animals, I posted it. It has to have a mouth, and that includes the soft tissue parts. So skulls do not count. Right? You, need, you need some meat. Right, doesn't the whole mouth doesn't the whole thing, you know, like every single part of the meat doesn't have to be there, but you got to have enough of it there that the mouth holds together as a mouth, right? And um, several other rulings on like how Goodberry works and some of the other stuff. And my point is that that those became rules for us that are just had the same force and effect as whatever rules are written in the book. And I ran them the same way. And so when the bad guys were counterspelling, right, I, like, either if somebody said they wanted to cast a spell, I would interrupt them and say, okay, this thing starts trying to counterspell. Usually, like, I always gave them time, right? Once I made this ruling, I said, you see the slot starting to gesture and he's clearly casting a spell. And I paused, right? And if my best friend didn't say anything, I would say, would anyone like to attempt to counter this spell? And my best friend would think about it, right? Once, I think, maybe, or twice the whole campaign, he said, all right, I'm going to use my reaction to identify it. Right? And I think the one time he failed, so I'm like, well, you don't know what he's casting. You're not sure. And he was like, crap. All right, I'll counter it. Right? And it turned out to be something like Fireball, so it was good that he countered it. 
Another time, he identified it, and I told him what it was, and he said, I'm going to let it off. Right? I'm not going to counter it. Because he didn't want to waste his counter spell. Or his spell slot. It was something that wasn't that bad. Like, it was a firebolt or something. Sometimes, the monsters had abilities that weren't spells, and, like, the slot can throw, can hurl flame. And a couple times when the slot hurled flame, he was like, can I... Can I... Is that a spell? Can I counter that? I'm like, no, it's not a spell. See, they can just throw flames around. Just one of their abilities. Darn, I wish I could counter that. Right. So, we did it consistently. Right. If he announced a spell before... Like, if he didn't just say I'm casting a spell and just announced that I'm, I'm casting Fireball, I would say to them, okay, I am going to have the monster make a reaction to attempt to identify this spell. Sometimes I would say, well, I'm going to give him an intelligence roll to see if he's going to even think to do this. Depends on the monster, right? And I would roll in the open. Right? I'm going to give it a DC of 15, and I would roll in the open. Okay, he made his intelligence roll. So this monster is going to attempt to react and identify your spell. What's the level of the spell? Here's the DC. Roll in the open. Okay, he has identified this spell, and he wants to stop it, so he's going to counterspell it. Right. But I never just said counterspell. Because we had agreed that you can't know the identity of the spell before it's cast. So as a GM, I have to know because I got a rule on things. But the monsters don't know. Right. And so we played it consistently. Both my best friend, who's the only one that had counterspell, and I, who sometimes had monsters with counterspell, didn't, didn't, didn't have it a lot. We were both very consistent. So counterspell always worked the same way in my game right it didn't we didn't do rule of cool oh it'd be cool if you countered it here we had it work the same way for both the pcs and the npcs throughout the campaign right and the whole idea of doing that is to make sure that things are consistent and fair, right? The monsters don't get to do stuff the player characters can't. The player characters don't get to do stuff the monsters can't. Right? And that keeps everything consistent. What's going on with this alcove wall here? And so, um, but it, rule of cool, right, breaks that consistency. And that's why Luke said he didn't like it, right? Because it makes things arbitrary, guys. And the thing about good GMs, Alex Macris knows this, uh, Professor Dungeon Master knows this, and obviously Luke knows it, is the GM should never be arbitrary. Right? Because arbitrary means, essentially, unfair. Right? If I arbitrarily decided it would be cooler for the slot to just know that my best friend was throwing a fireball here and stop it, that wouldn't be fair to him. Now he's wasted a spell slot. If I just told him I didn't want him to cast fireball, he could have cast something else. Right? But because I, I decided that oh, it would be cool for the slot eye to stop you here. Right? I think it would be more fun to do that, whether you agree or not. That ruling wouldn't be fair. And you always want things to be fair, right? Judges need to be fair too, right? Um, let's let me give you a great example of something that was arbitrary and I assume highly illegal. Um, I knew this uh, student when I was a teaching assistant, so I, she was older than I was. She had kids and stuff, and I was in my twenties. Her name was Heather. She's a good student, um, and she was very funny. And we were on this field trip, and. We stopped at one point. There was we were like in the in the woods, and we had walked around for a while, and it was kind of hot. Uh, it was a hot, warm spring day, and the class stopped at like this area that had like benches and picnic tables and stuff. And we pulled out our our waters, and we were just sort of resting. The, the professor was there with us. We were sort of resting and just taking a break for a few minutes before we went back to doing the field work. And. Heather starts telling this story. I don't remember how the story came up, but she starts telling this story. And uh, she said she was uh, driving 
in her hometown, which was on the coast of South Carolina. Um, this was, I think it was a few months earlier. And she said, um, she got pulled over. She was speeding. She knew she was speeding. It was right that she, you know, like the cop was right. She like, she didn't try to get out of it. Right. The, the police, the policeman caught, got her and she said, you got me officer. You're right. I was speeding. Right. But she said, this cop was obnoxious. She said he was so rude to her that she got really angry. Um, and she decided, even though, you know, she didn't have a case to uh, avoid the ticket, that she was going to show up at court and she was going to tell the judge just what she thought of this police officer and how rude he was. She hoped that maybe, perhaps, he would get disciplined on his rudeness and not do that to other drivers. Okay. So she gets to the court. And she said it was, she'd been to traffic court a couple times in her life. She said it was mobbed. I've never seen it like this. It was absolutely mobbed. And it was all people there who had been pulled over by this rude police officer. And they were all there to complain about him. So each and every one of them, when their turn came, basically said the same thing she did. Yes, I was speeding. Yes, he was right to pull me over. But he didn't have to be so rude about it. And so she said, I don't know if the judge was sweet on him or if he was a relative of hers or what. But she said this judge was getting madder and madder, not at the police officer. She was very clear, but at the people who were complaining about the police officer. And she was really lowering the boom on them. She was really mad. And none of them got out of their tickets at all or anything, right? So Heather came up, came up and I, I don't know, let's say, let's say it was a $90 ticket. Heather comes up and the judge says to her, um, ma'am, I just have one question for you. And Heather says, uh, yes, your honor. And she says, how was my officer? How did he behave? And Heather said, you know, she had seen what happened. So she said, oh, he was fine instead of complaining. And the judge was like, bam, $40. And let her off at like half the price of the ticket, right, half the charge. And so Heather told this story and, you know, we chuckled at it. But this is exactly what Macris is saying you shouldn't do, right? That judge arbitrarily changed the fine for something that had nothing to do with the law, right? It wasn't because Heather wasn't speeding or had a good reason to speed or explain that, you know, like it was an emergency, my cousin was having a baby, none of that, right? It was, did you like my officer? She said, yes, okay, fine, I won't charge you so much. Probably never happened again. It didn't happen before. Nobody who came before Heather could have known that if they just were nice, they would have gotten off, right? And it's quite possible that nobody who came after Heather and said, oh, he was fine, got a reduced sentence or a reduced fine, right? That's the problem with rule of cool, right? The GM thought it was really cool of Heather to say, oh, he was fine and not say anything. So he didn't do as much damage to her character's financial, right, hit points. You see what I mean? And the problem with that is it's not consistent. It, it, is it going to work next time? We don't know. It depends on what the GM thinks is cool. It's arbitrary. Arbitrary shouldn't happen in law, and it shouldn't happen in role-playing games. Now, a lot of people say, well, look, we're just playing this game to have fun. Yeah, but if you don't have rules and things are unfair, is it fun? Right? Think about the guy who cheated all the time in my Champions game. Okay? This isn't about rulings, but it was unfair to everybody else. And when he became a GM, he was super unfair. He did rule of cool with his own characters and had them solve all the problems and defeat all the villains as NPCs. And we just sat there watching. 
So now the rule of cool is leading to a bunch of people not having any fun. Okay? That's why you have to be careful with that. It seems harmless when you do it once. It seems harmless. It's just a bit of fun. Right? But if you keep doing it, and if this becomes a big part of the game, it can become a poison that ruins the game experience in the end for everybody. And this is what Luke was trying to say. If you have rules that everybody follows and they're consistent and you play it right, you can have a really cool game that provides a challenge and is super fun for everybody. If you start making stuff up, not following the rules, going with rule of cool, whimsically ruling on things and then changing your mind next session, like Alec Mackers was talking about, you have a really high probability that you're going to end up with hard feelings from players who are going to remember that you let this guy do it last session, but you're not letting me do it. And you have a really high probability that you're going to end up with a game that's just, in the end, not a lot of fun, right? It's sort of counterintuitive. Well, if it's cool, if we're doing rule of cool, how could it not be fun? Well, inconsistency can ruin the game for people. Okay? So, what you always want to do is have a consistent set of rulings. I highly recommend people, um, if you are uh, doing a lot of house ruling, write them down. Put them somewhere that both you and the players can reference so that everybody has access to it once you make the ruling. I mean, you don't have to do it in the middle of a session, guys. You know, I'm not talking about that. You don't have to do this in the middle of a session. You're, you're playing the game. But after the session's over that night, the next day, uh, the following weekend, whatever, go into your Discord or get into your email or whatever it happens to be, however you guys communicate, and contact your players and say, here is a write-up of the official ruling that I made last night. This is how we're going to play Leaping Caverns. From now on, is you have to roll under your decks, and for every twenty, every every 10 feet, you can do 20 feet that way, and then for every additional 10 feet or whatever, 5 feet, it's an additional minus 1. Right? Or however you want to do it. And then, whenever somebody tries to leap a chasm... You pull out that email or that house rule or you get it up on your phone or whatever and you go, okay, here is how we have decided as a group that we're running this and this is how we're going to play it. right? And now, it's fair. Because everybody's got a copy of the ruling just like everybody can have a copy of the rules if they want them. Everybody's got a copy of the ruling and everybody can look it up and see that it's the same way we've always played it. Right? And that avoids arbitrariness. Now, what if you still want to do some cool stuff? But Scrapper, I mean, we want cool things to happen in our game. Why can't we just do that? Well, that's fine. Just be consistent. You know what the best way to do Rule of Cool is? Play Savage Worlds. I'm not just trying to haw hawk that game. Savage Worlds has Rule of Cool built in. It's called, they're called bennies. If your player does something cool, give them a benny. And then they can re-roll damage. They can re-roll trait rolls. They can re-roll support rolls, whatever, right? They can use the cool to do, they can do something awesome with it, right? Here, take a benny. That was funny. That was funny. That was cool. That was awesome, right? You don't necessarily have to just allow something unallowable. Remember that in Savage Worlds, bennies allow you to influence the story, right? So, I think I've told this story. My, uh, a couple sessions ago, my best friend, they were in a, an abandoned general store that didn't have any actual functioning equipment in it. And um, the door to the back room was locked. And my best friend, nobody had thievery as a skill, I don't think. And my best friend wanted to get in there. 
And he said, well, how do I do it? I don't have the skill. I said, you roll D4 minus 2. And he was like, uh. And I said, it's an additional minus 1 without a set of lockpicks. He said, does anybody have a set of lockpicks? Nobody did. He said, well, can I root around this general store and find a set of working lockpicks? And I was like, well, it's pretty unlikely they'd have that in the general store. And he seemed disappointed. I said, I'll tell you what, since they were new to Savage Worlds, right? I said, if you give me a Benny, you can influence the story. I will let you find a set of lockpicks, right? That's the rule of cool. You want it, you want it, it would be cool to find a set of lockpicks here and pick the lock? Okay, give me a Benny and I'll let you do it, right? Um, if you watch the Wild Cards ETU show, there are several times when the players want to do something cool or unlikely or whatever, right? Low probability. Is, you know, can I look around and find something like X? And the GM says, uh, no, it's not there. And the player will say, if I give you a Benny, can I find it? And the GM will say, well, yeah, if you give me a Benny, I'll let you find it. Right? So, I mean, it was super fun. My best friend found a set of lockpicks. Because he gave me a Benny. And I said, you find under, like, there's some old papers and crumbled newspaper. And you, you push them aside, and it's super lucky. But you find this beautiful, uh, it's a really nice leather case. You unzip it, you open it, and you see, maybe it's not, you uh, wouldn't have a zipper. You unclasp it, right? And you look inside, and you see this really gorgeous, like, completely untouched by time or decay or anything, like new, mint condition set of lockpicks and like everybody was chuckling and if they'd been in person they would have been high-fiving each other cool right Every, this is cool rule of cool man this it worked it was great but he gave me a benny for it right there's a mechanic in savage worlds to do the rule of cool if there's if the rules say you can't do something you can give me a benny and i'll let you try it right or if logic says this wouldn't be here you can give me a benny and i'll let you try it so he found the lockpicks, which was awesome, right? And everybody was excited about it. <laughs> then he had to make his spellcasting roll to um, uh, to cast boost trait, and he failed it. So he had to use a Benny to re-roll it. He boosted his thievery to D4, or maybe D6 even, right? From nothing. Then he took the lockpicks. Tried to pick the lock on the door, and he crit failed the lock picking attempt. So everybody cracked up, and I said, "Well, since he crit failed, I said the lock picks weren't as good as you thought they were, and they break, and you don't have a set of lock picks anymore." And he was just, I mean, practically rolling on the floor laughing, right, shaking his head. He says, "I wasted two pennies." But it's a crit fail. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't reroll. He said, "You can't reroll crit fails, right?" And I said, "Nope." And, you know, so then, I mean, it was super fun. We enjoyed it. We had a ball. But my point is, I allowed him to do it because he gave me a Benny, right? Savage Worlds actually has a mechanic that you can use for the rule of cool. So my suggestion to you is if you really like the rule of cool and you want to do it a lot, get a game system that allows it. I think Pathfinder, I haven't played Pathfinder 2. But I, I, somebody was saying that they have something similar to Benny's called Hero Points that the GM can give out. And um, Luke Hart was even saying in that stream because he was asked, they, I guess they had a near TPK and what happened. And he said, oh, it actually was a TPK, except that the GM kept giving out Hero Points. And they were able to use the Hero Points to, like, avoid dying. I don't know exactly how Hero Points work. Um, feel free to, you can comment if you want in the um, comments to tell us how Hero Points work so that people listening to this can get some understanding of it. I don't know how they work, um, but I think they're sort of like Benny's, right? So it's the same thing. Um, in D&D, &D, right, you can use inspiration. Give your players an inspiration. Give them all an inspiration at the beginning of the session and say, instead of rule of cool, if you really want to do something, use your inspiration to give yourself advantage and increase your chance of doing whatever it is, right? The DC will be very high, but you can use your inspiration to try and do it, right? And then you're not destroying the integrity of the game to allow coolness because you're using a an existing game mechanic 
to do it, right? Now, I don't feel like inspiration is all that useful. I feel like bennies are much better because the, the nice thing about bennies is they let you re-roll, yes, that's great, but they also, as part of the rules, bennies allow you to change the story. It's one of the functions of bennies. And so you can, if you think something is cool, you can use bennies to change the story. Now the question I have here is why is this atrium floor still not finished? What did I miss? This happened the last time too, and I had to just keep going around the floor doing this because there were little spots on it, even though I was very meticulous about cleaning it, as you guys saw in a previous episode. Um, so yeah, guys, I would say um, if you want to do Rule of Cool, introduce a coolness mechanism. If your game doesn't have bennies, introduce some sort of a mechanic like hero points or bennies or inspiration to your game. Tokens, whatever you want to do. Give everybody a free token at the beginning of the session. And so you can use this token to influence the story. It's, it's now a, a rule in your game, right? And because it's now a rule in your game, it's not just rule of cool anymore. It's here's this token. I'm going to use it to influence the story a little bit, right? And it's not just random, and it's not just whimsical. And when somebody says, but Joe was able to do this thing to one-shot the dragon last session, why can't I? Well, Joe gave me the token, the awesome token. If you want to do it, you can give me your awesome token. Oh, I don't want to give that to you. I want to hold it for later. Well, then I'm not going to let you one-shot the troll, right? And now you have a set of rules that have consistency to do the inconsistent thing, right? But you've still got that consistency there, right? Um, Jordan Callerman used to have a table Benny. Like, what was it called? I um, can't remember what it was. Uh, the clue token that could be unlocked and uh as a gm the gm would put the clue token okay the clue token has been unlocked you can use it as a table benny that is anybody the table has to agree to use it as a benny or you can hand it to me and i'll give you a clue if you're stuck they almost never used the clue token for a clue the only time i remember them doing it is uh, megan caves who is the gm's wife um she at one point they weren't she wasn't sure that they could trust this uh, police officer named bishop i i trusted him but they weren't sure they could trust him or not and she was so torn and she said can i use the clue token to find out if we can trust bishop and the gm said you know what since you guys never use the clue token to get clues i'll let you use it that way i won't even think about it so he said is that what you want to do and she said yes and so jordan took the clue token and said yes you can trust bishop Right. And now they knew, okay, we can actually trust. And so uh, the GM said, you get, you definitely get the feeling that, you know, Adelaide, her character, definitely gets the feeling that this guy is, is trustworthy and that you can go ahead and, and tell him everything that's been going on and he'll help you. And so then they told him what was going on and he helped them, right? And so the point here is that um, that was not simple rule of cool they had a table benny or a clue token so do that right if you don't want to get into too many uh tokens and stuff and your game doesn't support it just create a single um rule of cool token that you put out every session at the beginning of the game and you lay it down on the table or in virtual you put it in foundry somewhere and you say to them you guys as a group can decide to use this once a session they don't carry over to the next session it's only usable during the session if you want to do something really awesome that's not accounted for in the rules i'll let you do it right and then the one shot of the dragon is because you used the table benny not because the gm just quote unquote thought it was cool it's because everybody at the table voted and said we want to use this token now as a group to do this cool thing and the gm takes the token and says okay this thing worked and everybody cheers because now they agree that this is how they wanted it to be right and so my suggestion is if you want to do rule of cool that's great it can be a lot of fun but do it with consistency 
and not with arbitrary or whimsical uh, decisions, right? Because arbitrary decisions, whimsical decisions are unfair because there's never any way to know whether you're going to make that decision, the same decision again tomorrow or the next day. Uh, we'll leave it there. Until next time, guys, I am Scrapperlock, and this has been Scrapperlock Rants on uh, Power Wash Simulator. <laughs>